You're listening to Garden Futurist. I'm Sarah Beck. This is a really special time of year, and at Pacific Horticulture, we're attempting to connect with nature in a way that may feel a bit off kilter to many of us gardeners. We are embracing the darkness. Here with me to introduce today's guest is Catherine Rentz. She's the author of our new article, The Night Garden. When we first talked about the idea of doing a darkness theme, I thought to myself, I am not really a darkness person. I know that most gardeners are also <laughs> not darkness people, but I have to say that I feel like I have gotten into the spirit of this theme. I'm just wondering what your response now is to this idea of thinking of darkness as part of nature now, as opposed to when you first started working on this article. At first, I was thinking more design elements and different techniques and strategies, which we do touch on in the article. And I think it's totally important. But like my own relationship with the dark, you know, there's kind of our cultural relationship and our physiological as diurnal creatures with pretty poor night vision compared to a lot of other animals. The majority of animals are nocturnal or do the dawn, dusk, crepuscular thing. So like philosophically and culturally, like our human weird relationship with the dark and then realizing as I was trying to write these passages about communing with the nighttime and being like, I'm never in the dark, dark. I did want to ask you about whether you actually took that night hike to see arachnids. I did. It was incredible. What was that like? What happened? The naturalist that I was with, one gentleman was expert at picking up scorpions. So that's something to think about for the oak woodlands and redwood forests. There are indeed, I'd always heard that there were scorpions and there are. They're harmless, less than a bee sting. But what's really cool is when you shine these UV flashlights on them, they fluoresce. So instead of being this chocolatey brown that totally blends in with the rotten logs and everything and the leaf litter, they fluoresce this sort of icy neon blue aqua. I mean, at one point, he shone his UV flashlight over the like bank cutout from the trail, you know, and there are probably eight of them there that you would never notice in the daytime or even really at night. Oh, that's amazing. Connecting kind of that idea of getting out and seeing these things that we don't normally see, these creatures we don't normally see in other life forms in ways we don't normally see them because of our limited visual capacity, and then connecting that sort of with the idea of embracing this season in a sense, I came to a conclusion during all this gathering research that nighttime is one of kind of the last wild places. It's accessible to almost all of us if we can get out of a place that's kind of permanent sky glow. And, you know, we don't have to drive to Yosemite or to the backcountry or take a flight to Tibet or something. <laughs> Like we can just stay up at a time and be out at a time when a lot of humans aren't out and there aren't a lot of cars with headlights. And so that's really neat. It's almost an equal opportunity experience, not quite. And it's wild. I love that. That's a really nice insight. I really loved how you cultivated in your article this appreciation of moths and you use butterflies as a contrast example because I think there is perhaps a tendency for people to think of moths as maybe the less less exciting duller version of a butterfly but that is not so. Moths are incredible animals and incredible pollinators too and none of this is to knock on butterflies. I love the butterflies right but there are 15 times more moths than there are butterflies, species of moths. So just by sheer numbers, the pollinating capacity of the work that they do is amped up, right? Yet about a third are severely endangered. And the science is pretty new. Only over the last maybe 10 or 15 years have people really been studying moths and how light pollution is affecting them. This is really a great point to make. And it's really exciting that we got a chance to talk to a scientist whose research is very broadly ecologically focused, but really moths are a big component of that research. We spoke with Dr. Shannon Murphy about her research on the impacts of artificial light at night on moths, herbivorous insects, and invasive plants. 
Dr. Murphy is a professor at the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Denver. I just want to start by asking you, are you a night person? No, not at all. I used to be when I was a grad student. You know, I'd stay up really late working every night in the lab. But ever since I had a child, that's over. And if it were socially acceptable to go to sleep at 7 p.m., that would be me. I can totally relate. Although I have to say, I mean, this is my unscientific polling, but most people that I've ever interacted with in the garden and horticulture industry, I mean, we're talking about morning people generally. So in a way, it's really interesting at this time of year because I'm noticing I actually experience the night more, the darkness more. It's getting dark in the early evening and I might still be outside and I'm, you know, looking a little bit at the sky or very early in the morning. I've I've had some mornings very early recently where you know, I was really enjoying seeing planets and the moon and so beautiful. As we're thinking about the fact that light pollution has negative impacts on many organisms, starting from this idea that, okay, light pollution can be a problem. I'm just wondering if you can give us some orientation as to how long research around this has been going on. I totally had this memory the other day. Maybe it was a National Geographic years ago when they first started getting those really great satellite images and you could see, oh, wow, everything's so lit up. I don't really know exactly when people started pursuing it as a dedicated area of research, except to say that it really has seemed to ramp up in the last 10, 15 years. Because when I first started here at DU, it was harder to find a lot of research on light pollution. That was almost 15 years ago. There were a lot of papers that was interesting that were about what wavelengths of light to use to attract insects. So we as insect ecologists use a lot of light traps as ways to catch nocturnal insects and moths. And it was interesting to see how papers from the 60s and 70s were how do I attract more insects to my light trap and what frequencies of light would be more attractive to those insects? And now I think the research has completely shifted of how do we create lights that don't attract insects or how can we avoid that? There's lots of research looking at how lights along coasts were damaging to sea turtle populations. And I think that really started to ramp up, you know, in the 90s. But I would say that for insects, it's like the last 20 years, maybe at max, that people have been really thinking about it for problems with conservation. The last 10 years, it's really ramped up. And I think the whole idea of the insect apocalypse that people started worrying about in the late 2010s is really when we started thinking, oh, there's probably a lot of problems out there, not just light pollution, temperature, heat waves, sound pollution nutrient pollution, and light pollution. And it seems to me that the field is growing almost exponentially right now. That's fascinating. You're really in you know, a new frontier of a field, it seems like. It is. It is exciting that we're learning so much. Unfortunately, what we're learning is how bad it is for insects, but it is exciting to be in a field where we're discovering new things. I want to mention that gardeners have such an interest in this topic now, thinking about supporting food webs within a garden is really important to a lot of people. And I'd like to ask you about your most recent publication, which is a really exciting paper. Does artificial light at night alter moth community composition? And so going into this research, I'm just curious what impacts you're investigating. Yeah, so when we first went into it, I had a graduate student start with me in 2010 who was really interested in moth communities and also light pollution. And we thought this would be really interesting because the research that was out there about light pollution and insects was actually surprisingly not really about moths when we started it. What we were also interested in, though, is teasing apart the effect of direct street lighting, so the direct effects of the street light near where the moths are living, and what we call sky glow. And so sky glow is the effect of light pollution that's like an indirect light source. And I think the best way to think about it is if you go out on a winter evening outside your house, even if you're not in a city, usually there's some sky glow going on. And if it's cloudy, it all looks a little orange and it almost feels sometimes almost like daylight, even though you might not be near any street lights. And that's sky glow. And so that type of light pollution affects 
people who aren't even in cities. If you're even near a city, you're probably getting some of that. We were studying short grass step prairie fragments that are left over in the cities of Denver and nearby. My student, her name was Kylie Grunna. She was amazing. And she very industriously set up this experiment where we went out and sampled moths at night all over these different counties. And I think almost surprisingly to us at first, we found an increase in diversity of moths at sites with a lot of streetlights and direct streetlights, and then a decrease at the sites with sky glow. And then we started realizing reading the ecological trap literature, the literature about animals that have adapted with cues in their environment to do a certain behavior. And then now with human impacts, that cue is no longer adaptive, it's maladaptive. And we can't say for sure whether or not street lighting is a ecological trap for insects. But the way I think of about it is that these street lights are attractive to moths. And so they are drawing them into these patches, almost like a sink with the water draining in. So you conclude that artificial light at night can significantly alter composition of an entire taxonomic community of nocturnal moths or lepidoptera. So what is the significance of this? Are there some long-term implications for the health of the urban ecosystem that can be implied as you're unraveling your understanding of this? So a lot of our light pollution research that we have is looking at how individual species respond to light. I think there's still a lot of species that have never been studied or investigated, and we really need to know how these species do respond to light. But even if we know how one species responds to light or one population is responding to light, we also have to think about how those species are interacting with all of the other species. And then something I think a lot of gardeners are familiar with is the idea of what we call ecosystem function or how is that ecosystem functioning? So like we think of pollinators as a really important thing for our gardens. So how are the pollinators being affected? And then when they're affected, how does that affect the whole functioning of our garden ecosystem, so to speak. And so I think that by focusing on individual species, we might have an idea. We need a lot more research on individual species, but we only have an idea of what's happening to that one species by itself or a few species. So what was really great about this work is to see how an entire community's composition is changing because of the lights. Something we want to look into in the future is what parts of that community are changing? Are we getting different species that have different importance to the environment or functions in that environment. We haven't delved into that, but it would be interesting to know what's happening with the really important pollinator species or what's happening with the ones that are agricultural pests, you know, as caterpillars. And so we need to delve more deeply into that. It just seems like there are endless possibilities, especially when you're talking about all these different sites as well. I mean, you've got urban, peri-urban, suburban, edge of agriculture. Kylie worked really hard to find sites that differed in size because we know that a lot of patterns that you see in community composition of species depends on how big that habitat is. She had a lot of sites spread out all over the Denver metro area. And so it was logistically really challenging work to do, for sure. She was going out at night as well to check all these? Yeah, so we had a crew, two of the other authors on the paper, Cesar Nufio and I went out too, and then we had a crew of really amazing undergraduates who helped us out. And we would go out and sample these moths, and then at a couple sites for a few years, we would collect them every hour so that we would get an estimate of like when species were coming out at night and like when the lights were most affecting them. That was one of the most challenging things about this project was actually just working at night. So everyone who worked on this project, almost everybody, was a woman or an underrepresented minority. And we started to think about how dangerous it was for us personally to be at these sites at night. We had some kind of scary encounters, both with people <laughs> but then also with coyotes. That is such a fascinating element of this. And we talk a lot about the urban wildland interface. And, you know, I think living in the West, you especially experience this sense that, you know, a lot of the animal life is accustomed to having these spaces when we're not there in the dark. 
Yeah, you must be really developing these new protocols for this type of work. The National Science Foundation actually has a new push where every grant that is an ecology grant that's going to have field work has to have a statement about how you're going to ensure safety of the researchers involved. And I 100% support that. It just brings up such a fascinating component of urban ecology in general, too. I mean, this is a world that we're moving into. And as garden futurists, we're thinking a lot about the fact that the populations of the West are getting much more urban centered. That's why we have streetlights is to increase our safety, right? Right, right. I really want to ask you also about the work you've done on how light pollution can alter plant insect interactions, because I think this is where it gets really interesting in this food web conversation. Could you talk a bit about your findings on artificial light from street lights having an impact on plant toughness? Now, when I read the word toughness, I'm assuming you're not talking about resilience. No. So there's toughness and hardness. And if you think of a coconut, it's hard to crack into a coconut, but once you crack into it, it actually splits quite easily. So that's hardness. But then toughness is if you think about ripping a leaf, it's tougher to rip the leaf or you can get it started, but then like it's still tough to get through it. And so we were measuring toughness as a physical property of the plants. And this is actually also Kylie Grenis's work. So she did a greenhouse experiment where you grew different plants in the greenhouse and measured a lot of different things about it. But the one that we looked at with caterpillars, we grew this invasive plant smooth brome in the greenhouse and a caterpillar that we found pretty commonly in the field. And then she fed them plants that were either from under street lights or not from under street lights. And then we did what we call a complete factorial design where we crossed all the factors that you could be thinking about in this experiment. So we have street lights in our greenhouse and their sodium vapor greenhouse lights up there that are basically just street lights. And so we were able to have half the greenhouse under street lights and half of it not under street lights. And then we were feeding caterpillars either under street lights or not under street lights plants that either had been picked from under street lights or not from under street lights. And so we had very real situations of caterpillars feeding on plants that not under street lights and the plant had never seen a street light. Or we had a very real situation where you have caterpillars under a streetlight feeding on a streetlight plant. But then we also had things you would never find in nature where we'd have a caterpillar under a streetlight, but eating plants that had never seen streetlights. Or a caterpillar that's not under streetlight, but eating a plant from streetlight. So those are things you wouldn't find in nature, but it helps us to understand what the factor is that's affecting insect growth. And what we found, which was really interesting, was that there was a very negative direct effect of being under a streetlight. So the caterpillars that were under streetlights grew more slowly and didn't gain as much mass. And then the indirect effect was that the streetlights were negatively affecting the plants. And then that somehow was negatively affecting insect growth. So even the caterpillars not under streetlights, but were eating streetlight plants had slower growth and less biomass. And so then we measured everything we could think of that people say is important for caterpillar growth. So we looked at carbon and nitrogen and how much biomass there was on the plants. And the only thing that came out significantly different between our street lit and non-street lit plants in that experiment was toughness. And the plants were tougher under street lights. And so we presume then that the caterpillars were just having a harder time eating it and maybe it was taking them longer to eat that food. Wow, they were like, this salad is terrible. Yes, it's a terrible salad. That is such an incredible story. And I love hearing sort of how you reduced all the factors down to figuring that out, too, because obviously you can't really ask a caterpillar, like, what is the problem here? (laughs) Why is this plant not helping you gain weight? You're not looking so good. So we started growing a lot of different plants in a greenhouse, either under streetlights or not, just to see what happened. When we were doing that research, we did find that some of the plants changed their, what we call a carbon to nitrogen ratio, where they ended up having more carbon and less nitrogen. So in some ways that's making it like junk food, like snack food, like a Cheeto for the caterpillars. And other plants changed their allocation of resources to above ground biomass from below ground. So they had more plants above ground and fewer roots. But then what really blew us out of the water was another terrible invasive plant, cheatgrass. It grew like seven times bigger under streetlights above ground than when it wasn't under streetlights. And it just 
went nuts. It just loved streetlights and was growing so big. And that really surprised us because we were like, wow, check this plant out. It loves streetlights. And since it's a terrible invasive, that's not a good thing. <laughs> this could have like incredible implications, I'm assuming that there are other plants yet to look at here. But you know, if this were to be a, a common trait of a lot of invasive plants, this could be a real problem, right? Yeah. So we didn't find it with the smooth brome, another invasive plant. It's also a brome, just like the cheatgrass is. But but again, this was a greenhouse experiment. So everything was controlled except for the street lights. But we wondered then, well, is this happening out in the quote wild? So in the alleys of Denver. And I noticed when I was walking my dog, just anecdotally, I started to notice there was cheatgrass everywhere in Denver alleys. And I just wondered, I was like, I wonder if this is happening out in the field or the wild and urban settings similar to our greenhouse. I helped run a science camp with two of my colleagues, Jennifer Hoffman and Robin Tingatella. And we have a science camp that we do for middle school girls every summer. We had these girls help us design an experiment to test whether or not cheatgrass was thriving under streetlights outside as well as in the greenhouse. And so we did this experiment where we walked up and down alleys and we did poles that had streetlights or poles that didn't have streetlights because along with the girl campers, we realized that the pole itself might just cracking into the cement might be something that's helping the plants to grow in an alley. And then we also did intermediate between the poles to see where there were, quote, not as much streetlight, although you still have a lot of sky glow, but it's not right under a streetlight. We also measured plants there and we taught the girls how to recognized cheatgrass, and we sampled alleys all over Denver, around the University of Denver. Wow. Big data project. That's awesome. It was great. We had them help us analyze the data, and they learned how to do that. And then they were involved in the publication process. So nine of the campers ended up being published authors on the paper, which was really fun. They're all in middle school. And we found that we were more likely to find cheatgrass under streetlights than not. We're also more likely to find plants in general under streetlights. And then the cheatgrass was, I think it was three times more likely to be found under a streetlight than not under a streetlight. Are there any benefits from cheatgrass as far as habitat or food for insects? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> but what we started to wonder was if we have eradication programs where we're getting rid of cheatgrass in more natural areas around cities, but we're not thinking about what's happening in the cities, this almost could be a colonizing population to recolonize areas where they've eradicated it or tried to. And so I think that'd be really interesting to think about what's happening with cheatgrass in urban settings, since it is clearly thriving under streetlights and how that might be affecting populations in more natural areas. You're listening to Garden Futurist. We'll be back in a moment. Garden Futurists come in all sizes. And I'm sure we have yours because the Pacific Horticulture Marketplace is now open. Share your Garden Futurist identity around town and in the garden with comfy, sustainable t-shirts and sweatshirts, Hit the trail in an activewear shirt or be the most amazing auntie or uncle when you show up with a statement onesie. All make great gifts and you'll be supporting the good work of Pacific Horticulture with every purchase. Shop now, pacifichorticulture.org slash shop. Devil Mountain Nursery was founded in 1995 and has grown to become the largest landscape professional-focused nursery in California. Devil Mountain is growing an expanding palette of climate-resilient trees and shrubs, and they have made a commitment to producing plant material with better roots using innovative growing practices. Check their website for upcoming professional events, as well as educational plant guides for everyone on native plants, low water use plants, and plant community recommendations like planting under oaks. DevilMountainNursery.com
Oh, it sounds like there's just so much more to know on this. And I mean, invasive plant issues are huge. Just thinking about all of these spaces in cities. And, you know, we talk a lot about how even just having connectivity between small ecological patches in a city for pollinators or to benefit insects. Thinking of those spaces getting filled with something that is in no way beneficial and is becoming super dominant from a garden perspective. I mean, if you are in an urban environment, you probably want to reduce the amount of artificial light on plants that you're hoping will be attracting those caterpillars, right? I mean, I wonder for garden plants, I haven't actually studied garden plants and how they react to streetlights, so that would be interesting to know how they're changing too. But there is research showing that plants senesce later if they're under streetlights. And I've sort of anecdotally noticed this in my own yard. I unfortunately live right underneath an alley streetlight. And I have noticed that that part of my garden seems to senesce later than the part of my garden that's around the garage and not near the streetlight. But there is other research showing that plants senesce later or lose their leaves or start to die back later if they're under streetlights. For the insect community that's necessary to have your garden plants. It does seem like it's not good. It just makes me think of all the things they say about children and screen time. Like you're not supposed to have your phone right before bed. It makes me think of the garden plants. Like, no, don't stay up late. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) I hadn't thought about it that way. That's a fun analogy. Are they up late reading? You do have some research that looked at native plant traits. Is that right? When we did the greenhouse experiment where we first discovered how much cheatgrass seems to like street lights, we also looked at four different native grasses and they didn't react the same way as cheatgrass did. So none of them grew significantly bigger under street lights than not under street lights. And none of them had significant differences in toughness. I think one of them had an increased carbon to nitrogen ratio. So it did become a little bit less nutritious for insects. It sounds like there's just so many more potential things, questions to ask yet, you know, in terms of plant species. You're talking about just really a few things here. You're talking about a particular invasive grass, right? And then also some native grass. Yeah, and we even noticed that when we were doing it with the camp. We wished that we had better abilities to identify all the plants that we were seeing under the streetlights because we started to notice, we're like, well, this one seems like it's here a lot too. And there's another example under, I study a moth species called fall webworm from a completely different perspective. We're looking at the evolution of diet breadth. But we had started to notice that on nights when we forgot to turn the lights off in the lab, they mate during twilight. And they really need that twilight signal in order to mate. So to maintain our colony, we turn the lights off when we leave during the day so that they get the twilight through the windows. And then the next morning we come in and they're all mating. But we've noticed that if we forget to turn the lights off or if our safety light in the lab stays on, that our mating doesn't seem to happen. And so then this summer with the camp again, we started to think, well, maybe we can look at how streetlights might affect moth mating. And so the campers helped us design an experiment again, where we put mating moths and we keep them in these plastic shoe boxes that we get from Home Depot that are clear plastic. That's where we put the moths into mate. We put the clear shoe boxes either under the streetlights in the greenhouse or not under the streetlights in the greenhouse. And I thought, you know, there'd be a difference that there would be fewer matings under streetlights than not under streetlights. But what we found was that no moths ever mated under streetlights, not one. And so now I'm starting to wonder, like, especially with the work we found with the community composition changing, is that if we're drawing moths into these streetlights, but then they're not necessarily mating under the streetlights or their offspring, the caterpillars are experiencing negative effects from feeding on plants under streetlights or just being themselves under streetlights. This change in community composition that we're seeing is probably manifesting through all different parts of the life cycle in the field. And that's something we haven't investigated either. So that would also be interesting. So we're analyzing those data right now. And one of my current graduate students, Michaela Tonino Springsteen, is writing that up as a paper. So that'll be exciting because now the campers will, from this year, will be on that paper too. 
The impacts of artificial light have been explored for few invertebrate systems and not at all for plant communities that are surrounded by urban areas. As we have emerging scientists coming into this field, and as you mentioned, this is really a new frontier, can you speak a little bit about just where you think this field needs to go? So I think there's lots of things that would still be extremely valuable for us to know. And so it talked earlier about how there's a lot of studies looking at how one insect or maybe one plant is affected by light pollution. And I think that's still really valuable, though, because there's so much we don't know about how other species are interacting with light. And so I'll continue doing that research, too. But I will also say that I think where we need to be headed is to be looking at what I call a community perspective. So in ecology, we think about populations of the same species. But then when we have all of the species that are living in an area interacting together, that's called a community and we really know very little about how communities are responding to artificial light at night. And so it's really important to know not just how individual species are responding, but then as we know how those species are responding, how is that affecting all of the interactions within a community? So are we losing pollinator species? Which functional groups are being most affected? Is it the predator insects? Is it the decomposer insects? Is it the herbivorous insects? Or is it the pollinators? And then how are those individual species changes affecting the rest of the community? And that I think is wide open. There are very few papers that look at entire communities of organisms and how they're responding to light pollution. And indeed, the paper that just came out last week was in a special issue of the Proceedings of the Royal Society. And that was the theme of the issue is that we need more community work. And there's other community papers in that issue, which are great. But that seems to be something that many of us are thinking is that it's also time to move past individual species interactions and be thinking about community wide impacts and how that's affecting the function of our ecosystems. You mentioned a couple times just that, you know, the individual gardener experience. I'm really curious how this field might be able to impact broader urban planning. I mean, could you imagine a day in which, you know, recommendations might actually be given? Some urban areas are already doing that. So, for instance, one of them that I'm the most familiar with is Boulder, Colorado, which is near here in Denver. They actually made a mandate that everybody needed to swap out their porch lights for lights that shine only down. And so some communities of humans are already doing this and figuring out, and I know there's other instances too, where some cities have made rules about how bright the street lights can be and where they're shining and whether you need to cap them so that they only shine down. So you still have the safety component of the light, but that it's maybe not going to be affecting organisms that are flying above the lights as much. There's somebody I was talking to who studies this, but from Germany, but they always look at the satellite images. It's experimenting with Tucson night lights. And Christopher Kaiba is the person who did it. They brightened, then dimmed some street lights for a few nights using satellite images to observe changes in Tucson's radiance. I remember hearing about it thinking, wow, that's really cool because they got a whole city to do like an experimental design where we're going to dim these streetlights. There's so much opportunity, it sounds like, for citizens to be advocates and for people who live in cities to be paying attention to this issue. Yeah, and I think it is something that we as citizens can be intimately part of. So I know I personally keep my porch light off as much as I can and don't leave my lights on outside and try not to light up the night sky as much as possible. But tempering that with the understanding that we do need street lights in order to be safe in an urban area. And I totally understand that. We don't want students walking home at night in dark alleys. How do we maintain our own safety, but without impacting the ecosystem as much as possible? It sounds like, to keep it simple here, if you're a gardener, Lighting that goes down and not up is probably a great place to start and a simple, and as you mentioned, turn off the porch light or turn off the unneeded outdoor lights, right? Yeah, if you can install lighting at your house that isn't on all night and shines down, that's the best we can do right now, I think. And then I personally don't have extraneous lighting out in my garden that I don't need. I don't have any lights in the back and then I have my porch light off 
all the time <laughs> just to try and be a friend to the moths. And embrace the darkness, right? Go out and experience the beauty of the night and that darkness experience. Yeah. And it's fun that that has become a theme for the camp that we run every summer because there's two of us who are ecologists who run it and a third person's an astronomer and they clearly oh, wow. have interest in light pollution too, but for different reasons because we can't see the stars at night anymore. And so all three of us realized that even though we bridge fields from biology to physics, we're all three very interested in artificial light at night and how it's negatively impacting our areas of science. So it also is bridging different scientific areas, which is really exciting too. This is an area of research that is pretty recent in its importance because the globe was not so covered with bright light up until fairly recently in human history. And now we have this burgeoning field of study around light pollution and the impacts of artificial light at night. Thinking about how many insect species there are and then how many plant species and how, how many relationships in that web, the permutations of that. And then doing that research and then using that research to actually take concrete civic or political action to start changing this urban infrastructure and just on our own scale, how we garden and what we can do as gardeners. Let's talk about that. Just how much artificial light is impacting our ecology is really incredible. And it's such a human problem, or rather a human created problem. And this is also what makes this research feel hopeful, I think, in the sense that, you know, as we're becoming more urban, as humans are living in cities even more, we have this opportunity to take action and to do something about this. It's surmountable. It's not like some of these other grand problems that are also from the last hundred years and human induced. I mean, you look at Flagstaff, a city where over 20 years ago, in 2001, they were designated a dark sky city. And you look at the work that has been done in Tucson in the same way and experiments that they've been doing and simple solutions like directing light downward rather than up into the sky or turning off the lights at night. It is hopeful. It's exciting to see that there are models happening in cities more and more each day, I think. And it feels like concrete and relatively simple. I think this is a fascinating conversation about city design and planning as well. And I, I love when we get into things like this, because when we think about change we can make in a microcosm such as our own garden, that's really cool. You know, this idea of downlighting and really thinking about what light needs to be there. But then we think about just that large scale sense of design and could we be designing our cities in a way that creates space for all of the other ecological processes that need to happen. And, you know, if a park was set up, obviously for humans, for people to walk through and feel safe in the dark, but also, wow, is there a place for the moths to mate? We just need more ecologists and entomologists in the city planning and board of supervisors. I think this is a fascinating space we're getting into with just the urbanness of life. And actually, the urban conversation with Dr. Murphy, I thought was very interesting. I feel like she was saying that the fact that all of these plants that she was studying were, you know, not in a wild nature environment, they were in an urban setting, like an alley. I mean, it's sort of that other side of the nature connection coin, right? Of how even if you live in an urban environment, you can still get connected to nature and the nature in an urban setting is still getting affected by things and how so and how do we manage that. Yeah, new campaign designed for bugs. I love the moth mating garden. Thanks everyone for listening today. If you liked Garden Futurist, please share it on your favorite social media platform or follow us on Spotify. Find us at pacifichorticulture.org. Pacific Horticulture is a place where powerful ideas can change the course of the future. Our plant stories lead to actions that make us and our habitats healthier. Now, during our end of year campaign, the best gift you can give is to become a member. 
Try on our new Pay What You Wish Phosphorus membership. Here is where you make a difference. Your membership dollars go directly to creating educational content within our very lean operation. It feels really good to support this hardworking nonprofit. Find out more at pacifichorticulture.org.